Hallelujah. Anybody grateful? Anybody grateful? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Gratitude is the superpower of disciples. I said gratitude is the superpower of disciples. I know we have a to-do list. I know you have a grocery list. I know you have a wish list. But if you create a gratitude list, I promise you, it'll be a shield against envy and jealousy. If you create a gratitude list, it is the basis of self-esteem. If you have stuff to be grateful for, that means you can't be basic. If you have something to be grateful for, that means you have an asset-based view of yourself. If you have something to be grateful for, you have a God who's been great to you. A gratitude list, not only a to-do list, not only a grocery list, but you need a gratitude list. Has God done anything for anybody on the stream? Has God done anything for anybody in the sanctuary? You ought to be grateful and you ought to be granular. Your gratitude ought to flow from your lived experience. Your gratitude ought to flow from how the last seven days have been for you. Hallelujah. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. Put your hands together and give God a great praise one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You can take your seats in the sanctuary. Hallelujah. Grateful. Thankful. Hallelujah. Mindful of the goodness of God. Hallelujah. G gratitude is... Um, I'm paraphrasing. Hopefully it's a responsible paraphrase. Uh, it's one of the most important emotions in the Christian life. When we cultivate gratitude, a whole lot of other things come in its wake. When we cultivate gratitude, it helps us to develop more confidence in God. It helps us to develop confidence in ourselves. When we cultivate gratitude, it gives us a consolidated sense of our identity as disciples. You, you don't need somebody to pump you up to praise when you have a litany of things to be grateful for. Grateful Christians are always praising Christians. Grateful Christians are always worshiping Christians. Grateful Christians uh, are never nasty Christians. Grateful Christians are not mean-spirited Christians because if you're grateful for what God has done for you, it, it makes it hard to be mean to somebody else when you know that you are indebted to the goodness and grace of God. Hallelujah. If you ponder all of the reasons that you have to be grateful, they taught me growing up in church, count your many blessings. Name them one by one. You ought to spread them out over your bedside before you go to sleep. Count your many blessings and see what God has done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, uh, verses 4 through 6. Hallelujah. I'm trying to let it go, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful that God keeps on supplying reasons to be grateful. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 7. Uh, when you get there, say amen. All right. That sounded like a quarter of the room. Uh, I'm going to say that one more time. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 7. When you get there, say amen. Hallelujah. And if you're able to stand, won't you stand as we collectively acknowledge God's word together. Family, we are in a new preaching series, as Pastor Gabby mentioned. Uh, the title of this preaching series is called, I Think I Love You, and we're going to be talking about love in its various forms and manifestations, grounded first in God's Word, uh, and also uh, grounded in uh, as a uh, complement to help uh, illustrate some things, uh, some of the work of Bell Hooks, as we talked about a bit earlier, her text in particular, all about love. Uh, I take it that we are all there in 1 Corinthians, Amen. All right, I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of God's Word, which reads this way. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. 
It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. This is God's word for God's people. Somebody shout, thanks be to God. You can take your seat as we pray over this time of proclamation together. God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for uh, the preserved wisdom and revelation that has passed down generations and now stands before us, uh, which we regard as your holy scripture. God, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to assemble one more time, God, to assemble in person, to assemble digitally, and to hear a word from you, God, that will encourage us. Uh, and that will help us to carry on as you would have for us to do. In the name of Jesus, we simply say, come Holy Spirit, come Heavenly Dove. Stay right here with us in this preaching moment, filling us with your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. amen. Say amen. amen. Won't you help me announce my title? Somebody say, I'm working, I'm working. on something. I'm working. Let's do that one more time. I'm working, I'm working. on something. Oh, come on, say that like you got a few things that you're trying to get around to. I'm working on something. All right, let's dive into it together. Love is a growth-oriented, goal-oriented perspective that we incarnate in community. Love is a growth-oriented. We're trying to develop a goal-oriented, meaning we have a point of focus, perspective that we incarnate in community. To love another human being, are we together? To love another human being is to continuously grow our understanding of who that person is with the goal of taking premeditated positive action for their good. Uh, so often we talk about premeditation in a not so happy, not so constructive context. Amen. Uh, but that doesn't exhaust what it means to take premeditated action. If you really love somebody, you don't freeze them in time. I don't hear nobody in the sanctuary. If you love somebody, you don't freeze them in time, but you're continuously allowing them to introduce and reintroduce themselves to you so that you can grow your understanding of who that person is with the goal, with the objective, with the aim of taking premeditated positive action for their good. Can we do a micro Bible study right quick? 1 Corinthians 13 belongs to a specific genre of letter writing. This 13th chapter is a poetic meditation structured within an ancient form of letter writing called the epistle. In other words, Paul is giving us uh, good, good bars and giving us the best lyrics that Paul has to supply so that we pay acute attention to what love is. Why? Because love is one of the most commonly used and also most frequently abused words. Paul takes time to carefully uh, and considerately map out what love is within the genre of the epistle uh, so that he can give us a memorable meditation on what this love thing is all about. And if you read the first 12 chapters of Corinthians, you see that Paul is trying to inspire a complex community of human beings with the history of conflict and all kinds of personalities. Somebody shout all kind of personalities. He, he's trying to talk to introverts and extroverts. And uh, the psychologists tell me there's even some, something called ambiverts, where you got a little bit of the introvert and a little bit of the extrovert. He's trying to talk to everybody and help them understand how you practice love on purpose, how you practice love as a habit that shapes you so uh, consistently that it starts to permeate your whole being. And on this first Blessed Sunday of Black History Month, I want us to consider three aspects of what it means to develop love as a practice. I know we're working on business plans. I know we're working on visions. I know we're working on friendships. I know we're working on dreams. But all the things that we're working on will be accelerated if we work on love. All the things that we're trying to do, all the things that we finna do because it's Black History Month, I feel a little vernacular. All the things that we fixing to do, if you work on love, you will undergird all of your undertakings. 
The first thing that we can develop as it pertains to love is to develop love epistemically. Somebody say epistemically. In other words, love develops a point of view. Love develops a way of seeing the world. When we talk about epistemology, that simply is a way of verifying that something somebody says is true. Love develops epistemically so that we can uh, equip ourselves uh, to test every spirit because Lord knows everybody pledging love is not actually practicing love. And before we uh, squint our eyes at the external practice of love, if you look in the mirror, oh, come on, somebody, if you look in your phone with the golden hour selfie light, you know that you, too, don't always practice love as assiduously as you know how to do. If, if we tell the truth and shame the devil, we don't always practice love with the care and the rigor and the regard that we know how to do. And so it's for others' benefit as well as our own benefit to develop an epistemology of love, to develop a criteria of love, to develop a framework so we can know what love is and what love ain't. In verses 4 through 8, Paul delineates this kind of epistemology, uh, which gives us this sort of criteria. And I want somebody to know, I told you it's Black History Month, that centuries before Mary J. Blige began her epic search for real love, Paul, the antecedent to Mary in this respect, gives us the 411 on what love is. Oh, y'all like Mary J. Blige. Bless the Lord. He, he, Paul tells us what love is, this is the epistemology, by a mixture of negation and affirmation. Affirmation is what love is. That's what we want to do. Negation is what love ain't. That's what we want to avoid, what we want to discontinue. Here's the negation in the text. Love isn't envious. Love isn't resentful. Uh, love doesn't hold grudges and keep score. Love isn't boastful. Love doesn't insist on its own way. And that doesn't mean that love isn't assertive. It means that love isn't aggressive. There's a difference between assertive and aggressive. Love ought to be assertive. Love ought to share its preferences. Love ought to have some standards. But there's a difference between having standards and trying to bulldoze over people. Love isn't arrogant, but there's some things that love does do. Somebody say it with me. There's some things that love does do. It's incorrect grammar, but it's correct for your social relationships. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love bears all things, hopes all things, believes all things. To practice an epistemology of love, we need some things we try to do and some things that we are no longer going to do. Paul gives us a negation as well as an affirmation. Jesus put it this way. He said, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Some versions of love deserve a yes from you, and other versions of love deserve a no. And developing an epistemology of love gives us criteria, gives us a framework for sifting out what we want to put our weight behind, where we want to stand ten toes down, and also where we can know that we sit at a table where love is no longer being served. And so we need to get up put the chair underneath the table and walk away. When somebody remembers your birthdays, career milestones, and special occasions, that's something you might want to give a yes to and affirm. Uh, but when someone is quick to argue and slow to listen and allergic to commitment, that might be worth a no, worth a negation. Love that declares, I have one black friend, so I'm good on all this diversity, equity, and inclusion stuff. That might be a kind of love to which you say no if I'm talking to anybody in the sanctuary. Some kinds of love deserve a yes, and some professions of love merit a no. Let me invite bell hooks to enter the chat and all about love uh, she gives uh, what she calls six ingredients about love Th these ingredients of love uh, can help us to develop an epistemology of love so we can be clear about where we're saying yes and clear about where we're saying no are we walking together church Bell Hooks says that there's six ingredients of love what are they pastor Andrew responsibility respect commitment care, 
knowledge, and trust. This means that for any kind of relationships, professional, romantic, church, justice stuff, school buddies, BFFs, uh, colleagues, associates, for all your relationships, the questions you ought to be asking, the questions uh, with the help of the Holy Ghost, I'm asking God this. Can we just run through a diagnostic right quick? Can we just take quick inventory in the church? Can we practice a spirit of inquiry together? Is this relationship based on mutual respect? Is this partnership uh, based on shared understanding? Is this friendship grounded in collective responsibility or is it lopsided responsibility? Is this coalition rooted in reciprocal commitment? These are the kinds of questions that can help us verify and validate whether somebody saying they love you actually loves you. These are the questions we can use when we engage in self-examination. Am I actually loving somebody, including am I actually loving myself? Or am I simply talking about love but not walking in what Paul calls the more excellent way that is consistent with the experience of love? Is the relationship rooted in a healthy soil of trust? These are the kinds of questions, respect, responsibility, care, commitment, knowledge, and trust that can help us to diagnose whether or not what we see and what we perceive is actually love or rather it's counterfeit. Love develops an epistemic framework, but love also develops ethically. Somebody shout, love develops ethically. We not only need an epistemology or criteria of love, we also have to develop uh, an ethical commitment to love so that we can patiently and gently be loving presence in our relationships. The goal isn't simply to love after emergencies and after conflict and after argument and after misunderstanding. The goal is to have a preemptive, preventative practice of love so we can avoid the emergencies and avoid the misunderstandings and avoid the things that make you have to bury the hatchet in the first place. How about we don't have the ruptured relationship so there's no hatchet to bury at all? Love. Develop, love requires us to develop and cultivate and curate an ethical commitment to loving. And I want to make sure we're managing expectations in the sanctuary. The practice of loving continually and loving well is not a light switch that you turn on and turn off. Loving well is not as simple as pushing a button. Loving well is not as straightforward as a Google search and reading the first thing you see on the one page, the two page, and the three page. I know how we do. Uh, we Google any topic and we read through a few pages and then all of a sudden uh, we transform and transmute into subject matter experts. Come on, y'all know how we do in the sanctuary. But love requires us to develop an ethical commitment, meaning that we are uh, continually and consistently and steadfastly trying to act in a way that considers what will be somebody else's highest good and we act in a manner to advance that. We consider what will be our highest good and we do right by ourselves like we do right by other people. This is why the Bible associates justice with the image of walking upright. That means you want to do right by other folk, do right by yourself when you love as not only with an eye towards how it will uh, benefit you, not only with an eye towards whether you'll be recognized, but you do the right thing because internally the testimony of your conscience says it's the right thing to do. Love requires an ethical practice. It requires that we're always growing, always maturing, always developing. Where are you at in the text, Pastor Andrew? I'm in verse number 11. Paul uses a growth metaphor just four verses after the last verse we read in verse 7. And there Paul uses a growth metaphor of aging from childhood to adulthood as an analogy for ethical growth. He calls it putting away childish things. Have you read that uh, in the Bible before? Let me just get it before you. Paul says, when I was a child, I thought as a child. I spoke as a child. I reasoned as a child. But when I became an adult, 
Uh, Paul doesn't say nothing about your hairline going back. Paul doesn't say nothing about all the biological shifts that we go through when we get old. They are many, they are legion, but what he does say, bless the Lord, is that when you move from childhood to adulthood, you ought to put away some childish things. And in his description of verse 11, there's two things we have to note. First, he calls us to grow up ethically and to grow up morally. But we also have to note that being a child uh, doesn't mean that children are somehow not moral. It doesn't mean that children are somehow not intelligent. Are, are you with me? We, we want to avoid a misunderstanding of this text, uh, or we want to gently critique Brother Paul, because we can critique Brother Paul and still have robust respect for the Word of God. Amen. Uh, so children can also think in ways that are uh, convincing and speak in ways that are persuasive. But, but the root point that Paul is getting at, somebody say the root point. It, 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 it is right that we want to put away uh, the immature things and put away uh, the unethical practices that are not consistent with the way of love that Paul calls us to do in the last verse of chapter 12 to set up chapter 13. In other words, love puts down the childish things of picking fights for no reason. Love puts down the childish, immature things of labeling people you don't even know and sizing them up into stereotypes and putting them into uh, frozen circumferences that they can never grow beyond. Sometimes we think we have everything figured out about folks that we haven't talked with about nothing. Paul calls us to put behind these immature, unethical practices. Love is not content with yesterday's growth because love is always developing a higher, deeper, broader ethical practice. Love isn't satisfied with last year's development, with yesterday's development, because God is always calling us to go deeper, to grow deeper, and to develop an ethical commitment to love. Love is trusting that God can always endow us with the capacity and the choice power to opt for what will bless and benefit somebody else as well as blessing and benefiting ourselves. Love develops epistemically. Love develops ethically. But love also develops eschatologically. Are you with me today in the church? I promise this 30 is not just because Baptist preachers like to pick assonance and alliteration, but, but, but there's something that's eschatological happening in the text. In other words, there's action happening that is most properly associated with who God is and what God does rather than only what, who, who human beings are and what human beings do. Are we together? Paul talks about, uh, in verse 8, something that I want us to pay close attention to. And it's important to recognize that, that love is an eschatological practice because if we're only relying on human strength to love, then we're just going to have faulty and sometimey experiences of love because nobody that's human always loves uh, to the height of their intelligence and the height of their conscience all the time. It's important to grow. It's important to develop criteria for loving. But the truth of the matter is that our walk, even at its best, is a little shaky, is a little flimsy. And so we need to affirm in many ways that love requires human involvement, uh, but love in every form absolutely requires divine involvement. How do we know that this is the case? In verse 8, uh, Paul elevates us from strictly human strictly empirical categories to divine categories when he says that love never ends. Love never ends can only be true uh, if love never began. Uh, in other words, we can only affirm that love never ends if we have a conception of love uh, that has always been and always will be. Love never ends is tantamount and the equivalent of saying that God is the one who is from everlasting to everlasting. God is the one who says, I am that I am. I exist outside of chronological time, but I'm concerned about things that happen in historical time because I am God. Love never ends. Let me say it like the old preachers used to say down in the low country. God doesn't have a birth date and God doesn't have an expiration date because God is infinite. God is eternal. God is 
is uh, immortal, yet takes on mortal flesh so we can know what love is. Paul says love never ends so we can know that we're dealing with a God who practices love all the time, before time, in time, and when time reaches its conclusion. The text says that prophecies will cease that tongues will end, that knowledge will have its conclusion, but love goes on. And while we can partially live into verse 8, the truth of the matter is that love, as Paul is talking about it in this uh, most robust sense, refers properly to God's action. God's developmental love sees the distance between our God-created selves and how we often act. Uh, and God uh, embodies verse 7. In other words, G God chooses to believe all the things and hope all the things and endure all the things concerning our capacity to love. It's, it's not, um, it is a beautiful thing to know that God is always loving, but the critical question in the text is how can we become more loving? God believes that we have uh, untapped potential. God hopes all the things about our possibilities and what we might do and who we might become, even though we know in part now and we prophesy in part now, God knows that there is a more complete version of who we can be and a more full version of who we can be, a more robust version of who we can be. I hear ancestor Howard Washington Thurman in the room. He says that, 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 that God loves us in a place that is beyond our achievement and beyond our failure and places a crown on top of our head that we'll grow tall enough to wear. In other words, God sees a you that no longer hates who you see in the mirror. And God says, I see you loving yourself completely, loving yourself totally, loving yourself uh, incomprehensibly. God sees who you will become and God sees who you are right now. And God says, I believe you can close the distance. God sees sees who you are in this moment, and God sees who you will be in your latter moments, and God says, I have hope. God says, I have confidence. God says, I have high expectation that you will be who I had in mind when I created you. God says, you are fearfully and wonderfully made, and I will not rest, and my love will not end until you actualize everything that I put in you when I made you. God's love never ends. God God's love hopes all things, believes all things, endures all things. What it means is that we are not in a covenant where we're only holding up our side of the deal, but God is the one who's holding up the covenant that we have through Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God says in substance, I am working on something. I am working on making you more loving. I am working on redeeming a groaning creation. I am working on repairing breach communities. I am renewing every injured yet beautiful heart. God is developing stuff in this life and the life to come. We serve a God who foresees and foreordain something good, something loving, something true, something beautiful. The God we serve who is from everlasting to everlasting predetermines a glorious ending for the people of God. And what I need you to do is to hope and to believe that God's love is still on the throne, that God's love is still on the case. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And the question this afternoon is, do you believe? Is do you hope in the love of God? Can you clear away all the cynicism? Can you clear away? All that I heard this before. Can you wipe away the scales from your eyes and say, I am persuaded that neither life nor death, neither angels nor demons, neither powers nor principalities shall be able to separate, shall be able to separate me from the love of God. I serve a God who's rich in wisdom, rich in power, rich in love. I serve a God whose love lifted me. Matter of fact, the love is lifting me right now. Oh, the love, unsearchable love of God. Oh, the love, the wisdom of God's love. Oh, the love, the power of God's love. That love sought me, that love bought me when I was a stranger from the ways of grace. The love of God, 
that converts every heart to loving on purpose, loving for purpose. We serve a God who sees you when you counted yourself out. And God says, I believe all things, hope all things, endure all things. They may have counted you out. You may count you out. But God says, I still believe. God says, I still see something. God says, I'm working on something. No weapon form against you so prosper. I'm working on something. They working for evil, but I'm working for good. They plotting your harm, but I'm planning your good. God says, I'm working on something. I'm working for your beauty. I'm working for your joy. I'm working for your gladness. We serve a God who's working on something. Let me put it in a more precise language. While we are working on something, God is working on us. God is working within us. Ephesians 3 puts it this way. God not only says, I'll do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ask, think, or imagine. That's what we talk about, and we should talk about that, but we got to continue the scripture. It says, according to the power that's at work within you, God is working on something on the inside of us. The purpose of being human beings who follow Jesus the Christ is for us to embody and be lowercase i incarnations of love just like Jesus was. God calls us to literally make the word of love flesh to a society that is understandably disenchanted and disillusioned with love. We ought to be the embodied evidence that love is still a thing. We ought to be the personifications of love so that folks know, oh, yeah, we're not perfect. We, we're not error free, but we are, 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 are so committed to love that people can see glimpses. And just like the sun is coming through uh, the window, we ought to have lives that allow God's love to peer through our pores every now and then. God calls us to be embodiments and lowercase i incarnations of love. And when our resolution grows faint, and when our determination, are y'all with me, grow weary, because loving well is a difficult, hard business. We serve a God whose love never ends. Sometimes I, I think we underestimate why every theologian in every iteration, stream, denomination, and communion of Christianity says that love is the crowning attribute that makes God God. God's love never ends. God's love is a cushion for us when our love ends. God's love is our support. God's love is our strength. And as we talk about what it means to live into these ingredients of love that Bell Hooks talks about, God is our reference point. God practices responsibility and care for all creation. God redeems everyone, everything God made. God is the one who knows us fully, even though we know ourselves in parts and pieces and in fragments. God knows us comprehensively. This is why we say God is omniscient. And, and, and it is the generosity of God that knows everything about us and still forgives us and still loves us and still hopes the best for us. Knows all of your secrets, knows all of your dirt, knows all of the things you would do if given sufficient opportunity and resources and still loves you just the same. God loves us with respect. God's love doesn't call us to ignore our accomplishments and ignore our achievements and ignore our gifts. Matter of fact, God delights in giving us spiritual gifts. This is what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So we'll talk more about how God embodies all of these attributes and virtues. But I just want to recap a bit and then I'll, I'll, I'll pray a word to just close this time up. God helps us to develop a framework for love. Love develops epistemically. Love develops ethically. We got to be committed to love as a practice and not just an empty, superficial pledge we utter. 
but love develops finally eschatologically, which means that the, at the end of the day, we are depending on God's love to save us, to keep us, to sanctify us, to make us more capable of loving tomorrow than we are today. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for God's progressive love, God's perfecting love. God gives us the capacity to stand on our own two feet so that in interdependent community, you rely on other people for love, but you also have the capacity to raise a glass to yourself and to toast your own self. To love your own black flesh and find delight in who God made you to be. Let's have a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the immense magnitude of your love. God, we are grateful that you love us just as we are. And you save us as we are so that we can be all of who you already made us to be, God. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the catalytic dimension of your love, that once we experience it and fully see uh, your love for what it is and all of the many dimensions of who you are, we can't help but be inspired to more love ourselves. We can't help but be stirred and spurred on the inside to loving more, God, when we uh, grapple with and grasp. Hallelujah. How gratefully you love us. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that everyone in this time of uh, digital worship and uh, in-person assembled worship, God, that we might know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you love us, that you care for us, that your empathy surrounds us, God. And we'll be ever so careful to not only praise you for your love and admire you for your love, but God, let us be determined to receive your Holy Spirit's power to help us walk in love for ourselves, for our neighbors, for our entire community. We trust you to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen and amen.